OK, so in three, two. Good evening. I now call to order the November 16th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. To conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask you that you inform Ms. Regino if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Regino, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Sure. Mr. Kuhn? Here. Ms. Hen? Here. Ms. Causey? Here. Mr. McMillian? Here. Mr. Offerman. He indicated he wouldn't be attending tonight. OK. Mr. Hartlove. Here. Mr. Tantliff. Here. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, can you please state your name? OK, Mr. Kuhn, back to you. Thank you. All right, so new business. <clears throat> um, first, we're going to go over FY20 and FY21, Every Student Succeeds Act data that we have tonight. Mr. Tantliff, if you could please uh, kick us off <clears throat> to review the information you've provided. Sure. Um, so just a quick review for everyone about <clears throat> I, in March, uh, Greg Barra, who's uh, a manager in the accounting office, uh, reviewed the ESSA reporting, which has been in effect for a couple years now, and that's the existing per pupil reporting. Um, it lags uh, pretty significantly the year end because it's not due uh, till close to the end of the calendar year, and then there's back and forth with MSDE. So by the time the report's final, for instance, FY22, it's probably like the February, March timeframe. So when we got together last time, uh, Greg or Mr. Barrett reviewed FY20. So uh, what I have today is FY20 and 21. Um, he went through in detail all the methodology. We're not gonna do that, but I will just take one minute and uh, go through the summary of the methodology that uh, we did share previously just to kind of get everyone calibrated. Um, and then, you know, we can just look through the detail at the uh, committee's uh, desire. So um, here's just some of the key points. There's a very, very uh, thick and detailed reporting manual that we included in board docs. Uh, but the, the goal is to allocate the per pupil funding at the school level and some stuff is the dollars are directly in the schools like a teacher and there's some uh, expenditures like operations that get allocated by square footage or other methodology. But uh, something key to note is that MSD gives us very specific guidance on the allocation so there's no uh, discretion or flexibility in the decision making. Everyone in the state follows the exact same template. So uh, the years here, this just happens to be the instructions that tied to the FY20 report, but it's the exact same for 21. So we use enrollment, staffing, um, and the facilities master plan, which includes the square footage, and that's for allocations. There's some things we exclude like community service, the capital outlay category, and that's um, 
expenditures within the operating budget. We're not talking about construction capital. That doesn't come into play here. Um, and non-public placement and uh, related expenses, which obviously don't happen in the schoolhouse, they happen outside the schoolhouse. So that gets excluded. Um, so the inclusion is things we can directly attribute to the school, uh, expenditures that we know are there. And uh, as I said, the rest of the budget uh, gets allocated. Um, and there's also central office expenditures uh, that are defined that also get allocated to the school because they directly support the school. Hey, so, uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Hen has a question. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thanks, Mr. Kuhn. Um, just a quick one, um, Mr. Tantliff. And thank you for going over this. For the data source that referenced farms data, are we capturing, or are we using an alternate source for those schools that have implemented CEP since we aren't ca collecting farms forms? Well, uh, for Title One, the in, the entire K through 12 population gets can't captured, so that's what we use in this report. There's no there's no farms allocation in this report. Okay, if if you would wouldn't mind scrolling up, uh, it was referenced for the special services, October 2020 student counts for EL special education and farms. It's the third bullet under demographic data sources. I'm not sure. Say that again, Ms. Han. Where is it exactly? Oh, here. It's, okay. It's shown there. Yes, thank you. Um, I think for, well, let's look at the report. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so I'm not sure the answer to that question. Just get the 20. I'm going to go on the 21 report. And then if we want to pop over to the 20, we can. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you wanted to look at it, Mr. Kuhn, but you had mentioned that NAACP letter. So I just uh, did highlight those schools in um, a different color. And see, uh, Ms. Hen, this is what I was saying. I, I think farms is interchangeable with Title I for this report. I, I don't, but I'll I'll have to get back uh, to you if farms is directly um, impacted anywhere in the report or okay. reflected. I, I don't think it is though, because it doesn't, for this report, there's no direct expenditures tied to it. It's the title one um, that's, you know, out gets allocated in the report. So it, it looks, oh, so it's not a whole school that would be qualified. Well, maybe it is. So for CEP, it's the mm -hmm. whole school. So I would expect that column title one to equal the enrollment. But if a school is not CEP, for example, Winfield, um, I would, if my logic is correct, I would guess that that's why the title one count is less than the enrollment. I, if that's based on farms data. So we're using I different think, sources. sure. And, and I'm not an expert on all the mechanics of, of this report. But what I believe is the Title I column reflects the K through 12 students in that school, in a Title I school, because a Title I school, everyone's Title I. So the Title I expenditures, you want to get allocated by all the students in the school. That's why some schools are the entire enrollment. And I believe the only difference is if there's a pre-K and the pre-K class, see, it's about 20 kids. Uh, I'll have to verify because uh, I apologize. I'm not an expert no, no on it, worries. but I think I think that's it. I think that's the only difference, you know, for argument's sake. Right. Yeah, we have looked at this information not. again. Thank you. So we, we yeah. have reviewed this data before. The part of the addition here is we have two years of data now. Um, yeah. And we can look, you know, at the information and see where there might be variations, if any. Um, so, so go ahead. Um, sure, uh, and I'll just mention, Mr. Kuhn, you had uh, the report that got that's in board doc is the same report uh, uh, we're reviewing, except I just have this sorted 
and split up now by division and by elementary, middle and high school. So it's a little uh, easier to look at. So you can see there's a central east and west tab and then there's sub totals for each of those categories. So we could, uh, let me just freeze this here. So, um, you know, if we wanted to look at all elementary schools in the West, here's their average per pupil. It's 13.9. So again, in the brains of this thing, there's there's tons of uh, spreadsheet allocations going on. This is just the output. Um, and, you know, at a high level, what you see is the schools are not dramatically different other than if they're Title I schools, because Title I is adding a bunch of federal dollars that get added uh, to the per pupil, but the state and local per pupil, there's definitely variations. Um, but for the most part, you can see there, it's not like there's 10,000 and 20,000. You know, there's a couple thousand dollar difference and it's probably just, the normal variations based on, you know, one school just due to their enrollment count might just qualify for an extra teacher in that elementary grade while another one uh, doesn't. So, you know, that intuitively makes sense. Our, not that it's a gigantic piece of this, but our operating, uh, the operating funds that we've reviewed before and we actually posted for information is strictly based on number of students. So it would make sense that all these things bring them all kind of towards the norm. There's hundreds of dollars and there might be a thousand or two difference, but like I said, I don't feel like it's dramatic. So just as an example, here's our elementary school in the West. It's just under 14,000 and you can see, um, there's variation. It's mostly, you know, Chatsworth is is not a, a you know, a regular example, but <clears throat> um, yeah. So you know, programs are going to be off the map, or there might be some anomalies going on, and there might be some things that just come out with a quirk. Um, of the reporting, you see camp field, which is, you know, an anomaly. That's why it's in green. It's just to highlight it. But uh, if we go back to the average, so it's 13,983 in the West. The central is 13,969. So literally it's almost identical. It's off by $10. Let me just freeze this. Um, uh, real quick. Sure. There's a question in the chat and I, it is, it says, is the percentage of expenditures for salaries roughly the same for elementary, middle, and high? I don't know if we can tell that here. Do you happen to know that information or? You you can't tell that here, but high schools would have a, a somewhat higher percentage because if you think about it, uh, in elementary school, you have one teacher teaching everything plus specials, whereas high school, because you you have very you can have very specialized classes you can have you know calculus and algebra and geometry AP classes so because there's a wide offering uh, there's going to be a number of those classes that have lower than average enrollment in them because there are so many different options in high school so um, I believe and if you look at the student ratios in the budget book you'll see uh, there's a little you know, more favorable student to teacher ratio, if you want to call it that at the high school level. And there's a page in the budget book that shows those target ratios, which drives how um, human resources allocates positions. Ms. Sam, you, you put another piece of a question. Do you want to just ask it? Because sure. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Sure, thanks, Mr. Kuhn. Um, I was asking that within each type of school, so across all elementary schools, is the percentage of expenditures for salaries roughly the same, would you say? Um, roughly. I have not looked at that 
uh, specific okay. question, but I, I would think they would be very close because elementaries in general are set up very similarly. The biggest driver that might push it up or down, like I said, is you might have one school that has that has that one child that pushes them to add a class, whereas the school Y uh, has just a couple less students and one less teacher. And uh, if there's or if there's a school that's really small, they might tend to have smaller classes. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally speaking, I think schools uh, that are in, within the you know 25 to 75th percentage of enrollment, uh, I would uh, assume or I would project would be very similar. I would think so too. And I'm wondering if we have enough data here, and this is fantastic by the way. So thank you for presenting this. Um, I'm wondering if we have enough data to extrapolate um, as to the experience level of our teachers and based on salaries because of our um, salary scales by looking at the percentage, right, of expenditures, even on a per pupil basis, again, to level the, um, playing field and looking at the percentage by pupil if our schools, if we can extrapolate to that level. And maybe we can't, but I'd be curious to see that analysis. And maybe HR no, would have that data instead, and that's a bit more accurate um, assessment. I, I think that would be a tremendous lift to put it together in that exact format. So you'd have to get your staffing by school, you'd need their salaries, you'd need their experience levels. I'm not saying that's not, that's not uh, doable. I don't know if it's anywhere. I'd, I'd have to look if it's anywhere in the background here. And there's also, you have to take into account itinerant teachers that are split between schools, um, you know, and it gets kind of uh, complicated, but I think the general, feeling is the easiest schools, highest performing schools to work at generally will get the most senior teachers because it's, you know, call it the most pleasant work environment and more challenging schools tend to get newer teachers. That's at least the stereotype of what happens and one of the reasons why uh, reporting requirements like this and the blueprint requirements for reporting that'll go into effect are to try to prevent that from happening and in blueprint there's you know significant incentives to go to schools that are challenged i mean not across the board but for the nbc certification um, this year if you're at one of the uh, high need schools you get 17,000 if you're nbc certified instead of 10,000 so you know, I think there's recognition of that phenomena. I, I can't uh, comment to the extent that it happens here. That would be fairly extensive analysis. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Tantliff, you have yeah, you have this broken out by elementary, middle, and high in each region. Can yes. we just kind of like? I just want to see what the averages look like. Um, okay. At the different, the different, um, map, the different okay. regions. If you have. So I don't have a, 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 So it's probably easiest we go elementary, 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 middle, middle, middle. So you can remember the numbers. So why don't we just look real quick at the three for elementary? Uh, in the east, it's fourteen four. In the west, it's thirteen uh, nine. So about the same, a few hundred dollars difference. And in the central, it's uh, 14. So again, in the West, it's exactly the same. The central and the West have the exact same number within a couple of dollars, and it's a few hundred bucks more in the East. Um, and uh, here you can see, Mr. Kuhn, the, the schools you were inquiring about, you can see I have them in light green. Uh, you, you can see Riverview. To, to the board member or to the committee members because that's the thing I have is is just it's it's not it's not diced out this way um it's yeah I'll ask Tracy statements. to post this version tomorrow is that what you were just asking yeah that would be great I yeah I, same data I just slight just mixed a little different so the light green is 
uh, the schools you had asked about that were noted in the NAACP letter. Um, so anyway, if we go to middle, uh, middle um, high schools, so high schools in the West are 1374. High schools in the East are 124, so a little lower. And high schools in the Central are the lowest. So the Central high schools, um, which some people may have an impression, are the highest funded. Again, this report is not perfect. It's it's certainly a valid data set to look at, but it's tw again twelve six in the central. Twelve. Wait a second. Uh, you have Owens uh, Mills in the central area. Let me go back to that real quick. Yeah. So I think Owens Mills would definitely be in in the west, wouldn't it? Um, I I don't know off the top of my head. I. You know, if something went wrong, I don't know that for sure, but you know, if there was something might have been wrong and we pulled the data together, that's possible, or Owings Mills might be in the central. Okay. And Pikesville, Miss Hen said. So that might be there could be a few that ended up in the wrong place. Yeah, it's just it's it's great to see this information and I think it, it tells an interesting story and 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 that making this data available to the public and to all the members of the board is a great idea because they can see it for themselves. I mean, sure. you have to report this. This is reported to the state, correct? It's, it's correct. And there's back and forth and there's things they have us correct. So every LEA uh, is required. It's a federal requirement uh, due to the ESSA law, the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, yeah, so you can see that they didn't uh, vary dramatically. So again, with high schools, in case we've lost sight of that, it was uh, 12 6 in the central, 12 5 in the east, and a little higher, 13 in the west, which makes sense because we have Title I. Um, no, we don't have Title I, but we have some of the higher need schools in the west. So the high schools don't have Title I. Uh, and then the question so where, where does Title I end? Is it elementary and middle school or is it just elementary school? There's middle school title one. There's middle school. See, title you can one. see right here, Lansdowne Middle, Woodlawn Middle. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then so on the middle schools in the West, we're at 129. In the East, we're, you know, almost the same, 13. And in the central. 12 8 so they're all very very close within a couple hundred uh dollars so you know i think that's uh one takeaway is that it's a very fair and impartial allocation method you know for the general fund funding you know the teachers are logically placed based on the student count where there's title one or the special ed pass through grant those uh, can add significant dollars. And uh, well, I think we'll actually, I predict over the coming years, we'll see a bigger gap uh, for the schools that are higher need because if nothing else, the concentration of poverty grant and the TSI grant, Transitional Supplemental Instruction, which is basically the reading and math specialists, a TSI, not as much, it's sort of, tapping out and then it goes away in a few years. But COP is increasing dramatically and will probably surpass our Title I funding. And there's about an 85% overlap for those schools. The COP schools are defined by the state, but based you know, at a high level on the same metrics as Title I. So as those dollars get put into those schools, and they weren't really in effect yet for this report, because again, it's FY21, 22 it started growing 23 had a big jump 24 cop is you know going to go up by like 15 million dollars or something like that i mean dramatic increases but very uh, no flexibility there's flexibility in how you spend the money at the school there's zero flexibility about which school gets that money we talked a bit a little bit about that you may recall when we looked at sort of the projected blueprint 
funding, but all the reporting and how the money gets allocated for the baseline funding is uh, still being worked out. But I, I think you'll see bigger spreads than you see now in the coming years. All right, great. Um, Mr. Mr. Tantliff, thank you for providing this view. Um, I'm going to open it up. Are there any other questions by any other board members on this data? Mr. McMillian or Ms. Causey? No, no, thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. C Mr. Um, Kuhn? Yes, go ahead. This is Ms. Causey. Um, good afternoon and thank you for um, this report. Uh, the transparency is very helpful and I um, also agree with the earlier comments that it will be helpful for our public to understand. So um, this is a state required report and um, so we appreciate the work that went into that. Um, are there going to be any notes uh, or asterisks that will indicate uh, the different programs that drive the uh, some of the differences that we see? For instance, uh, Chat Chatsworth is one that rolled by with a higher per pupil amount. Um, or is there, you know, if you click into the school, then do you go to their web page and you see, oh, they have this special program. And so uh, now we understand why, or the public can understand why uh, there might be a significant difference in one school over another school. Just so uh, clear, I, I, I want to just make a few comments. One, um, <clears throat> all of the reporting is dictated by uh, what Mr. Tantliff had started to review before we just moved into the numbers. Um, and, you know, if you take a look at the actual um, columns, you have the different like Title I, CTE, English Learners, you know, SPED, those numbers. That's tend to count right there. Right. Uh, they, they, they equal some sort of money uh, associated with them, from my understanding. On yeah, top of well, the base amount. Is yes, that that's exactly right. So the number of students, there's different, uh, you know, like the special ed money gets alloc pro allocated proportionally based on the number of special ed students in that school, the total bucket of special ed money. So just so we're clear, right, and the enrollment number is the base number, right? And then yep, there's right here. a certain amount for each child enrolled. Then you have the special ed, ed money, the English learner money, Title I money, CTE money, it's all cumulative, right? It's additive at each, each, each indicator, right? Like if we pick a line, let's pick Carney Elementary, right? Mm -hmm. You have 628 kids and students enrolled there. You have 121 designated special ed. So there's special ed money proportionate to the 121 plus money proportionate to the 39 English learners there, and that is how the money is allocated. It is, but uh, so you at a high level, you're completely correct. Um, but I'll just mention again, there's a lot of different things going on in this report. So if we know the teachers in the school, that 100% of that teacher goes to the school. There are certain things that get allocated based on the square footage of the school. There's other things that may get allocated based on the total enrollment in the school. So there's some things that are direct costs and there's some things that are. Um, here, let me just see the word. The um, yeah, there's attributed versus allocated. Do you guys still see the spreadsheet or the word document right now? Let's see the, the word, word document. document. Oh, OK, good. So you can see right here attributed versus allocated. Those expenses not direct, directly attributed to a school code or defined as allocatable. Uh, these, so the, there's a methodology though in that big manual that tells you how to allocate certain expenses and what it's based on. So there's really, a, I, I think a logical methodology, certainly different, you could do it differently, but there there is, I think, something that makes sense if you but there's a lot of different line items to go through if you know what I, i'm kind of getting at there Ms. Ms. to get, get back to your original 
question on Ms. Causey. There is a very small when you when we submit this data, there's a there's a small field that they allow you if you if you wish to to explain differences. A lot of it, I think, is Mr. Kuhn was and, and Mr. Tantliff were, were referring to. You can kind of figure out from the populations of various students. It, you, you, as you see a higher population of special ed students, you're going to see a cost related to that. and It's going to drive a higher cost for that particular school. But if there was a reason that for if there was some reason that was driving cost in one school to be higher, we could put that in a notes field that was out on the website. So when someone clicks on it, they could see that it's a very small. I think they give you 256 characters, very smooth, like enough for like a sent a sentence to say, here's what's driving the cost at this school. OK, thank you for that. Um, and if I could just um, dovetail with a, a example that is um, jumps out at me. So in 2020, Rosedale Center had 65 enrollment, 57 staff, 30,800 square feet. And then the total per pupil cost was $93,000. And then in 2021, it says the enrollment was 25, staff is 53, uh, again, the same square feet, 30,827. And then the per pupil went up to $239,000. So uh, that seems dramatically different. The other thing is Lock Raven High School had at the central uh, EDLP at Lock Raven High School extended day learning program um, had three students 2021 only one student but the per pupil cost went up from 50,000 per pupil to 159,000 per pupil and um, the reason I would like to understand that and for other board members and uh, new board members to understand that is we also have had conversations about uh, students that are in schools that are disruptive and need more support, uh, need uh, perhaps more staff supporting them. And we do have these schools um, that have specialized staff. And yet if the, you know, we have that space, we have the staff, and yet we don't have the students that we're supporting. Um, I'm wondering if anyone can yeah. unpack that a little bit. And with, I can take a first stab at this. If, sure. I think with some of the special schools and I, um, uh, I, I believe the, the enrollment is a point in time, so you got to take this with a grain of salt because enrollment can vary during the year, but it has to be this enrollment is at a point in time. So you're going to see a lot of variation in the, some of the smaller special schools, more so than what you're going to see in a, 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 like your standard elementary school. You're going to see more, you know, um, a, a, a more of a consistency in enrollment and of course some of these schools have higher costs so if you're if you're if the enrollment um, goes up or down uh, significantly the cost goes up or uh, up or down per student significantly so uh, those small schools you really have to watch how much you take out of this because I think there's a lot of variety a lot of variability in the enrollment from time to time um, and it can really make the cost per student vary and because your staffing is going to stay the same you know most of your structure is going to stay the same but the enrollment can can change these are you know some of these schools are are, are, are places where students come in they they stay there for a while and then they get sent back to their home school so you could have higher enrollments at some times at some time and lower enrollments at other times. So it can be a little bit misleading, I think, on some of the smaller schools. So, so I would just take that with a grain of salt on the, some of those schools. I think the other schools are much, much more uh, comparable and you can you can draw more conclusions out of those schools than maybe some of the smaller specialized schools. Uh, I'll, I'll just add uh, or just reiterate a different way. Uh, the, the reporting really is not geared for programs, and these are programs. Kids are are going in and out all the time. I mean, you know, we're showing one student at EDLP Lock Raven, so it, you know, I don't I don't know the particulars there, but it might not have really been in business. But you have a bunch of fixed costs because you have a you have a building, and if the if they're in a pretty big building, they're going to get allocated a large fixed cost because one of the components here is square footage. So 
the report is a, I think, a directionally uh, a valid piece of data for most schools, but it may not be for the outliers. There's reportings really not geared for a program. We do it and we have to report it, but the numbers don't really make sense. Two hundred thousand dollars per pupil. Um, you know, we all know that th that doesn't make any sense, or even fifty thousand. But it's because you have a building, you have a, a principal, maybe you have a number of teachers, and those things are getting allocated amongst an extraordinarily small number of students. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the explanation. Just before we move on uh, to the next topic, is there is there anything that we're not taking into account? Because I, I think, and, and my goal is to make this data public, you know, inform people on how to understand it, but is there anything that we're we're just not taking into account when we look at any of this information, or is it just pretty much a pretty solid reflection of a per pupil cost at at the at the specific schools that are listed that we can you know pretty much count on? Well, I think the entire budget gets allocated. So from that perspective, um, you know, it's it's a piece of data. That's a valid piece of data. It is not a piece of data that's bulletproof and can't be challenged um, from a logic standpoint. But this is um, there's a logic so that we can compare schools across the district and across the state. So I think it, it's a fair and reasonable methodology. Now, um, um, remember too, in FY25 blueprint. Uh, reporting, which we don't we don't have any inclination on what it might look like, but there's going to be the same sort of reporting that gets down to the school per pupil level. Now, ironically, both of these reports may still exist and they may contra they may not. You know, there may be contradictory um, amounts because the methodologies aren't the same. And, and I would just add to that. I think this this is put in place for a future where you really do get down to you get down to much less allocation of costs and more actual costs. So there's always the like Mr. Tantler said there's it's not bulletproof. It's it's an allocation at this point. I don't know that it'll ever be exactly every cost. I don't even know if that would be um, fair either because then you, you start thinking about things like uh, teachers benefits. And you could have two teachers. They are the same quality of the teacher. They, they're the same. Um, they're the same um, uh, uh, effectiveness. But one has a family coverage and benefits, and another one doesn't. I, you know, if you, you know, truly the one cost goes to the one school, and the other cost, you know, the other school doesn't have that cost. So, but the student's not gaining any kind of, any kind of benefit from you know from that so I don't know how valid that would be either if you get down to really capturing every cost so there's a lot of things to debate here as to you know um, but the direction is more and more of actual costs versus these allocations so you're going to get a more a more and more actual of a, a more of a, an actual cost versus an allocated cost uh, thank you um, Ms. Causey had another question it said where is Virtual learn the virtual learning program that didn't exist yet when this report was developed. So I see e-learning. Uh, so that's kind of like the old uh, e-learning that yeah, was still there. exists. Yeah. Is that is that the same as hospital and home, or is that? I I think they're um, they can overlap, but there is uh, an e-learning uh, component where we have remote teaching and I think it overlaps with some of the home and hospital which uh, also en encompasses live visits from teachers. Okay, great. All right so uh, we're moving on now to um, the um, FY 2023 Q1 budget line transfer report. Uh, Mr. Tantliff you could you could give us an overview and, and, and highlight sure. what we should look at closely. I'd appreciate yes. that. Be glad to. Let me share. Um, and this is in board docs, of course. Um, so 
<clears throat> if we go back to really at the beginning of the budget committee, uh, when Miss Hen was the, the chairwoman, uh, you know, we had talked about and, and really just go to board meetings in the past. Uh, there was, uh, you know, a valid complaint that uh, the board would get the budget appropriation transfer in April and not understand where all those expenditures were coming through. And again, the BAT, as we call it, um, doesn't increase or decrease the overall budget, but it just adjusts for spending by category because with a budget as large as ours, um, expenditures vary throughout the year. And so we need to, uh, in the end, get that approved by the board and the council. So the budget line transfers um, are the changes made uh, by the different offices around the organization throughout the year um, that in the end add up essentially to the budget appropriation transfer. Uh, the only difference is we have to kind of add a cushion at the end of the year because we know exactly where we are, but we have to base it on February actuals. So we'll move a little more money in than we need at the moment uh, just because of changes that may occur. And if you recall last year, we had proposed and the board approved uh, a little over $20 million in brand new expenditures, which uh, did not get approved by the council, you may uh, recall. So we developed this report, which shows each quarter the budget line transfers that have been uh, executed by each office. So we have an automa a fairly automated process now where the office submits the budget line transfer um, and it goes into a smart sheet process and then my, my team um, executes that budget line transfer. So uh, what we wanna do is each quarter review this with the committee so that you're not surprised during the bat. Uh, the only, the last thing I'll mention, and then uh, I know there's a couple of questions and then we'll just kind of flip through the report. Um, but Q1, July, August, September, that's this report. Um, then we're gonna do October, November, December. So we'll do that in the beginning of January, uh, but then we'll do an abbreviated Q3 for just January and February, since that's where we lock in the bat so that you'll have seen all of the transactions that um, go into the bat. So uh, before I start flipping through the report, Mr. Kuhn, if there's any questions, uh, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay, so just to start off, um, what, I'm, what I'm looking at, when you see a, a minus amount, the, that means the money's leaving that category and the plus amount is going to a different category. Is that is that correct? Yes. yes. OK, so just so that I can make sense of this, it looks like the chief academic officer, right, has a bucket of all schools. And then it looks like money's moving from the all school bucket to specific schools. Is that is that's what what's happening? I'm well, in this case, um, so if we want to start uh, going through the report. Let's, let's look at the largest number yeah. that I see. Well, okay. Minus so, $1.5 million. Okay. So if you see here, this is all the magnet allocation. So 100% of this is the per pupil magnet allocation that gets pushed out to the school. So that's why it looks like it's all sitting in CNI. But this is where, because we plan it, then there's a methodology to push all those dollars out to the school. Once they submit their plans to the magnet office, the magnet office approves it. And then we push all that money out to where they've budgeted it. So it's the same amount per pupil, but every school budget is, budgets it differently depending on their program, how many dollars they're getting, et cetera. So this entire uh, dollars going out here are just the central, they're not, they were planned to be the magnet allocation, but we're pushing them out because we don't push them out till the year begins, till their budgets are approved. Does that make sense? It, so it I, I just yeah. want to follow up with one thing because I sure. see I see contract employee and contract uh -huh. employee here and there. And then so so I see a it, it looks as if contract employee 
is spread over different schools? Well, so Mr. Kim, when we um, plan it, we try to put it in the right place, just centrally, where historically the schools have spent the money. So we have the money sitting in a number of line items that the budget office can manage. Then when the magnet office tells us what to push out, it's based on the budget of the school. So we have it, you know, we have it planned on 30 line items where we think it's going to be spent and we get it gets pushed out to all the different magnet schools into all the lines that they request. So the negatives are less interesting because that's just where we have it sitting um, to where this is where the schools have planned it. So all the positives are where we're um, pushing it out to the schools. Right, I'm, I'm trying to understand. So for instance, I'm, I, I'm looking, let's look at Towson High School. Okay. So I see two line items under magnet programs for contract employees, right? Of the total uh -huh. of 5,500 and 6,500, right? And I'm just, I see ma magnet staff development and magnet programs. Um, so I'm just trying to understand what that actually is. Is that is that a contract employee that, uh, that does well, that's X, Y, and Z? Called, although that's called contract employee, we'd have to look, but some of the uh, stipends for training and such also fall into that 1445 category. So that's just what that object is called, but this could just be uh, extra money being paid to employees for training, for, um, it wouldn't be here, uh, actually an EDA wouldn't fall in there, so yeah. But, to, but if you needed, you know, I believe the magnet office could produce the budget for each school. I believe they have that if you requested it. Here, it's just an object name, so it's, you know, it doesn't have that much meaning. I just see it spread across every magnet school. So I, I was just curious, is, is this literally a person that goes from school to school? Or, no, no, no. you know, no. I, I, see it's, it's staff it's development. Now, so, go ahead. So look, it's, it's staff development right here. So this is, you know, you're paying for time for someone to do professional development or you're set, you're paying some conference fees or some overnight travel um, for Towson High staff. Uh, in these amounts, because it's replicated. So if you look at the whole, it's replicated across all the, the magnet schools. I see it. I'm just literally just rolling through it. Yeah. So I was just trying to understand because it's a contract employee. That's pretty clear that it's for contractors, and if it's not for contract spending, then it's it, it should be called something else. Well, this is what it's called in our accounting system. I mean, it's an accounting report. I mean, we can, you know, dive in and explain. So, yeah, maybe some names don't make sense. You know, they made sense at the time, but maybe not now. All right. So, what else would you like to highlight? I've, I've okay. So, the most so interesting. This. What's that? I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I think Miss Hen has a question. I'll sure. I'll let her I, ask it. Thanks, Mr. Kuhn. Um, so, I had a quick follow up to Mr. Kuhn's question about um, the contract employee being spread. If it is the same expense it's not. and it, it's somewhat misleading if it's a central office expense, say the magnet office, but it's being reported spread across all of the magnet schools. And I think that's where he was going with this. Yeah, no, um, that's not, a, but that's not at all what's happening. Okay. If you look at these allocations, it's going to this school. This is the budget the magnet budget that Lansdowne High requested. All these line items are literally pushed into their budget that the principal and the coordinator can spend in that school. Okay, thank you for clarifying. There's no okay. central office allocation of a person. You know, it's not that. Okay. So you in can see at the school names here, those are the schools getting the dollars. And the central bucket is where all schools, that's just where we plan it. That's where we push it out from. Okay. Then my question had to do with um, you mentioned that each office submits their budget line transfers on a regular basis. Is that monthly, quarterly? 
how often when they need them. When they, when they need them. them. So you get one report. And is there a net zero total of that? I mean, so of increases, decreases for, the, yes, for that office's budget? Every submission has to net zero. Every every submission that we get, if it's out of balance, we'll send it back and work with the office to fix it. Okay, so all of, even though the transfers are across activities, it's net zero to that office. Yes, unless, uh, you know, if Mary Boswell McComas wanted to move money from one office to another, she could do that. But normally it's people managing within their own budget, but it could be, um, you know, money getting supplemented from one office to another office, if that was the case. Okay, and is there- But it'll still net zero. Either way, the transactions, the pluses and minuses will zero out. Okay, and these are on, I assume, an auto approval type process as long as they're, they're submitted? Is there a, a, ever an instance where one would not be approved, assuming uh, there's a net zero and- well, if they're $100,000, then I have to approve it. And there's usually, you know, some logic behind it. So um, most of the smaller ones are going to automatically go through. But my supervisor, who's super knowledgeable, if something doesn't make sense, she'll, you know, stop it or ask questions. But generally speaking, yes, they'll they'll go through if everything ticks and ties. Okay, and and these can be either pre or post expenditure, correct? Uh, well, it would normally be pre because you couldn't spend the money if your appropriation didn't have enough money in it, unless I did an override. Okay, is that is that common? Um, Overrides we, common. There. They're not very common, but for instance, on special ed, uh, where in the bat we'll move money from, let's just say salaries, because we have vacancies into non-pub, which let's just say non-public placements running a million over budget for the year, which which we know happens, which we correct during the bat. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't move the money until the bat occurs. So, uh, if there was a new purchase order for a new non-pub school, um, I would pro I would have to get an override because the budget's already expended, but I know that we're going to correct it once the BAT um, comes into effect, once it's approved. Okay, but, but protocols or, you know, the rules state that these should be submitted ahead of spending. So you're, so you're able to track it before Yes. So you know where everybody is before it becomes an issue in general. Yes, absolutely. We're checking accounting. We're looking at we're asking questions. So uh, everything's getting, you know, uh, pressure tested if it needs to be. OK, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the uh, the only there's one uh, in really most of this stuff is very standard. Uh, but I'm going to show you the one very interesting transaction. Um, here you can see CTE funds, same thing, centrally getting allocated, very similar to Magnet. Then there's a bunch of small transfers. Um, Kelly services. Now, he, here's the interesting one. Um, so Kelly Services, which the board approved this year to manage substitutes, is a contract expense it used to be a salary expense in activity three which is instructional so now we moved uh basically 23.5 million dollars out of salaries into the different kelly services line items so this is where it's sitting now uh 681 is nurse subs the 228 is regular subs this is where it came from. It came from benefits and salaries. So teachers, teacher subs, 18.3 million traditional subs. Um, the 2 million was the 2 million that the CE gave us for Kelly services. And then there's benefits. So 
Uh, you can see here, Ms. Hen, 23-508-657, 23-508-657. So this is uh, something you would normally not see, but Kelly was not approved. Uh, we didn't know if it was going to get approved, so we just left everything in salaries, knowing that we could move it during the bat if the initiative got approved, which it did. Sure. Thank you. And that would not be a net zero either because of the additional cost by using Kelly, correct? Well, it is because here's the two million that the CE gave us for the additional cost. So that oh, I see. Even if we had to take money from elsewhere, it would still have to be net zero. We can't do a budget line transfer unless it's net zero. Gotcha. But so again, here, see here, twenty three five zero eight six fifty seven. 23-508-657, so they're uh, in balance there. But, you know, it's going from basically teacher salaries to contracts, so if you didn't have any information on it, that would be something that would, you know, raise the hair on your neck, probably. That helps, thank you. Sure. Could you uh, just quickly go down and uh, to school balancing account, the hold back to just explain what that means. It's like sure. 53.75 or something. Um, Where's the bottom? Yeah, Maybe up a little bit more. It. it just, it, it looks like they're called technical adjustments. I'm just trying to understand what hold back and school balance balancing account fees. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, when we push the budgets out to the school, we only push 85% of their projected budget. So the last couple million dollars we hold centrally. And then once the schools get their final enrollment, we push the money out. Um, but there, there might be some things that just through the you know tediousness of the budget process something might be off something might have gotten planned wrong and we have That's to do a technical adjusted to move some money from point a to point b i'm trying to i know the line you're talking it's about five seven so it's down from wherever you are you're going okay. up okay so just so you can find it <clears throat> all right so you're basically just counting for things Yeah. All right, I'm going to. Yeah, have, so, uh, so Mr. Kuhn, here's the answer to your question. Yeah. Well, so the schools are doing BLTs. We have to keep the total budget in balance. So um, if they're moving money out of an activity, since the schools have no constraints on how they spend their money, we have to just keep the total budget in balance. So we're we're offsetting some of those transactions as they occur, and then it gets reversed at the end of the year once we uh, approve the bat. Okay, and just so that I'm clear, I'm looking at the, the classroom supplies has the the minus five hundred thousand, right? And then everything basically underneath it is going to total up to that amount to zero it out, right. correct? Yeah. So I, I see like mileage reimbursement multiple times there for various amounts, contract and services. It's just you're saying this category of classroom supplies is what you're taking all of those items out of. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, they, that was just where we, you know, like when we're talking about magnet, we put all the money in certain places based on historical spending. We know it's not going to be correct, but we're trying to get the activities you know, we don't want to put on one line item because then it'll be way out of whack. So based on his history, we try to put it on one line item in the central account that we that will push out um, appropriately. We'll try to have it planned uh, in the correct space. OK, is there anything in this report that has surprised you for the first quarter that you did not expect or you had to? Um, I mean, you've been at it for a while, so I guess you're, yeah. you're not surprised yeah. much, but I was just curious if there's yeah. anything that stands out that you 
would want to direct our attention to besides sure. the no. Kelly services, which is yeah. just to recap. Yeah, no, I can get surprised. So the first quarter report <clears throat> has the most transactions because we're pushing out all the all those new allocations. You'll also see in November when we get the final school enrollment. Um, when we push out the final 15% of the budget, that'll create transactions. Most of this stuff here is bread and butter, um, repeat year after year. Because you can see here's JRTC, CTE. That's what most of this is. Kelly, yes, that's uh, an anomaly. But you know, if we're doing Kelly next year, we would have it planned appropriately so it wouldn't generate um, a budget line transfer because we would have planned it all under contractual services uh, since we would know that going into 24. So I, no, I don't think there's anything uh, really spark. Yeah, I mean, it's really very bread and butter stuff here. Because other than the push outs, there, there's not that many. There's really just a handful of traditional BLTs in this report. Are there any other questions, board members? Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, sure. All right. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Causey. Uh, you have a question? Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. And um, I do just want to say that uh, tonight we have uh, shown and the staff has shown uh, the implementation of the public works recommendations. And uh, one of them uh, was uh, number 220, where BCPS should modify the practice of recommending budget transfers once each year and bring budget transfers to the board at least three times during the fiscal year. Um, so th that's wonderful. But the other thing that the um, is stated is that the the board should really approve these. Uh, so is there a plan now as we move forward with implementation to bring this budget line transfer to the full board? Is that something that in uh, the committee is going to be asked to approve or is that a step that's going to be <clears throat> included in the future? Um, that would not be operationally practical because if you think about the budget appropriation transfer, we're projecting for the full year how much money we're going to need in every activity. So at, at the end of quarter one right now, there's still three quarters of the year to go. So if you approve, let's just say we did a bat now. Well, some of the things we're doing now, we're moving money from activity A to B. Someone else might move it from B to A in quarter two. So in the end, you're just approving the activity change. So we would be approving something and then we'd be essentially unapproving it the next quarter. So it only makes sense to approve a bat once a year. It just would be completely, um, it, it would be impractical and it wouldn't serve any purpose to give you a bat. Um, if uh, well, there's no functional need. No, I mean, there's no. No actual. This is just accounting at this point. You haven't asked for us to to do anything. Right. Correct. Uh, Ms. Gauzy's. I, I see Mrs. Hens comment that's saying it's pre decisional. Yeah. So no, it does not need board approval. But is there. Uh, is there something else um, that you're you're wanting the board to functionally do to say we're okay with this? Is that I'm just trying to understand? Um, I'm just trying to, and again, this is a public works recommendation. Um, understand how we are continuing the implementation, how we are continuing the improvement in board governance, board oversight, um, and. You got cut out. Your your um. Your Thank community. you. So um, I guess if there was a concern um on the part of um the budget committee or a board member who can 
look at all these reports and watch the meeting, um, then that would just be a topic uh, of questioning or a conversation with uh, the superintendent or the full board if there was some major concern. Does that sound like well, that's how it would be handled? I, again, I think that making this information available to us in the budget committee and 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 to the public because it's available to us um, is one way where we can help uh, with some oversight. Uh, you know, if there are things that catch our eye that we believe are need some kind of addressing. So um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're doing what we need to here. Go ahead and start. Okay, let's start thank you. One. Yeah, I'm sorry I cut cut you off there, but yeah, I think the good thing is, is we, I think what we're showing is, is a lot of detail. Um, this is a level of detail that it's, we can't go any further than this. This is all the detail we have. But the good thing is, is you're asking questions, and that really is uh, because what you would get if we were to do a, a bat, which uh, I agree with Mr. Tantliff, it's it does. I don't know that there would be a value there. It would just be a summary of this. So this is really where the action is, um, and I think some of the questions. Um, we're good. They're good questions, and they are. Uh, you know, they do kind of. You know, if you want to see how the sausage is made, this <laughs> this it's not that exciting. But this is <laughs> this is this is kind of the detail of of how it's made. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I I I, I see here um, that we had ballroom dancing consultant here, and, <laughs> and I, I feel as if I should have been invited because I definitely need help when it comes to ballroom dancing. So. Those two hundred dollars, I hope, are well spent. Um, so, uh, you know, with that said, uh, let's close this topic and move on. I want to stay um, cognizant of everybody's time. Um, so, the next item we have tonight is to review the report of the FY22 per pupil and Title One budget allocations by school. This is an informational item. Uh, Mr. Tantle, if you could just explain what is what it is and um, uh, and walk us through it. Uh, I don't really want to spend much time discussing it unless there's a burning question. This is, is in essence for information for the committee and for the public. Please go uh, ahead. Sure, L let me just uh, pull it up. I don't have it up at the moment. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, so if you recall several months ago, um, we wanted to show, so this is still the 22 report. This uh, report, which is the school budgets is that the principals are managing. Um, does not get finalized as we were sort of talking about just earlier until enrollment gets finalized at the end of November. Then we finalize the budgets and push uh, whatever extra monies out are required. So if you look at the budgets in the budget book for the schools, that's only 85% of what they're getting if the preliminary enrollment holds true. Now, you know, this year it didn't hold true again because our enrollment's, you know, sort of flat to a year ago. I haven't seen any final numbers yet. Um, but what this report did is it, it's showing all the money that we allocate. So uh, our Butis Elementary, uh, here's the number of students. Here's the self-contained special ed students, which generate an add-on <coughs> in, in the principal's um, budget. Um, so here's their uh, enrollment based per pupil. Here's the Title I money. And then here is the total allocation uh, that they're getting. And here are the two COP grants, which also get allocated to the school level. And, you know, the principal in conjunction with now the Title I office. If you remember, Michelle Stansberry came on and explain the Title I allocation and the COP allocation along with Melissa Wistead, and I think uh, Dr. Boswell McComas was here too. So this is really just a summary of the money that sits in the schools that the principals have some uh, control over, 
you know, the budget may need to get approved like for Title I, but these are dollars that are sitting at the school level. So, you know, you can flip down here and uh, you can see it's all the schools. Now, uh, in January or later, since we don't have a re uh, meeting in December uh, forever uh, for the remaining survivors, we can uh, do the next version of the report for 23 because all the enrollment will be final. So Mr. Kuhn just wanted to bring this top of mind. It sort of ties to the ESSA report in that all these dollars would be a component of that ESSA report that we uh, reviewed earlier. Um, so that that's really it. It's just showing what the principals have at their disposal. Thank you, Mr. Tamworth. Um, are there any any questions? I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and Mr. Tamworth's done a good job explaining it. So are there any questions or comments at this point in time? Because this is our last our last item for tonight. Mr. Kuhn. Yeah, go ahead, Hussein. Thank you. Um, no questions. It's it's very clear. I just wanted to thank Mr. Tantliff for providing this. It's it's fantastic. And since this is our last budget committee meeting, hopefully not my last, but um, Mr. Kuhn's last, I, I just wanted to thank you overall for the outstanding support and work you've provided the committee. It's it's been an honor being on it and and you've been fantastic. So thank you for all your hard work for us. The transparency has been outstanding and our community um, has benefited from it tremendously. So thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Ms. Causey, you have a comment? If you're speaking, you're on mute. Yes, thank you. Um, this report is very, very helpful, and I can see we're looking at this and then going back to the MSCE required report on the cost per pupil, you know, spells spells things out. Um, I also just wanted to say that I really appreciate all the work that's been done in this budget committee. Um, I appreciate uh, Chair Han, who um, had the idea and kept pushing it forward and um, started it, and then it turns out that it was one of the public works recommendations that we um, do a lot of work that's in here and, and there is a lot of work that has been done. So I'm grateful um, to Ms. Hen, Mr. Kuhn, uh, all the other board members that have um, been on the committee and uh, the superintendent and staff who have uh, you know, worked diligently to provide these reports. Um, I think it's gonna be a, a real area of increasing trust and, uh, by having that transparency. So I, I think that's very helpful. Um, I also think it's gonna be helpful for new board members who are coming on. Um, and I'm wondering with my question, if there's been thought to um, any orientation for the board around all of this good information. Um, and if an answer isn't readily available, just uh, food for thought because this has been so, so helpful, I know, to me, and I've been on the board for over seven years. So I think for uh, the new members coming on, um, hopefully there's a way that they can uh, benefit from this. Mr. McMillian and I are going to make them watch all the budget committee meetings. That's <laughs> a requirement. It sounds like torture. Time. I don't think that's legal. <laughs> are you going to provide snacks? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. We we but, do have a, a an orientation. I'm I'm sure you guys are aware that there is a there's an orientation. There's a brief t period to go over budget at a very high level, and I will and, you know I'll, I'll I'm doing that, uh, but I'll make sure that um, I put a plug in for the you know they're going to you know, obviously hear from from existing board members, but I'll put a plug in for um, all the good work that happens here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last item uh, is our announcements and uh, adjournment. Um, so the next budget committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, January 18th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. Um, I'll make a few comments before we end this. 
Uh, first of all, I really want to thank um, uh, Mr. Tantliff, Mr. Hartgrove, um, and and everybody involved in in managing this. Ms. Regino, uh, appreciate your time. I know that this eats into your evening and family time, and um, I, I really appreciate making making yourselves available for this. Um, my hope, besides working full time and not really having the time to do it myself during the day, is to make this available to the public uh, so that they can see this information, uh, see where their tax dollars are going, how it's allocated and how it works. Um, I don't expect to be part of the budget committee come January 18th of 2023. Um, uh, you know, as an appointed member of the board, um, I have the option of staying around until my replacement is actually appointed. I'm hopeful that that happens quickly, um, but I have yet to determine, uh, you know, how long I'm going to, to stay around. Uh, so, um, uh, with that said, I, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming out tonight and for spending time on this. I know budget discussions can be dry, uh, but I always believe if you if you if you understand where the money's flowing, you understand an organization's priorities. Uh, so I believe that this is um, uh, you know a great way to understand what's happening throughout the system. Uh, so I just again, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, if there is, you know, no no further business or questions, uh, this meeting is now adjourned. And thank you for joining us. Thanks, thank everyone. you very much. Have a great good night. evening. Thank Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Over